All right, I think just in the interest of time, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. I've lost count of what number uh, huddle that we're on. It's Oh, it says here in the title, number six. Um, so we, we keep going on. Um, I thought we could do a little update from uh, Robin Kinney on the SAFE fund and the distribution around that and just how that's going. And uh, if any of the superintendents that are on have any uh, feedback or questions around that, we'll be happy to either answer those now or take them back and, and research them and, and circle back. Uh, also, we might be able to update you on uh, legislate, legislation introduced uh, that would uh, provide the ongoing stability over the next few years that I know several of you have asked for. Uh, we don't know a lot about that right now, but we can just uh, let you know where things are. Uh, Robin, you want to start with the SAFE Fund? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, thank you, Commissioner, and welcome to everyone. Nice to see you online again today. Um, wanted to remind everyone that the application process is now open. Um, and if you are filling out that application, again, we tried to make that simple for you to kind of just provide to us in narrative the three buckets um, from which funds can be dispersed, the $30 million that is available for KDE to administer to our local districts. We've had some additional conversations, so I'll, I'll provide you a few updates of additional information that we've um, learned along the way. But that application mailbox is kdesafe at education.ky.gov. Um, we have received one application today from Christian County. So thank you, Christian County, for going ahead and sending in your application. It's also allowing us to kind of see um, how you've put that together. And we may at times have questions back to you. And let me give you an example. Um, we are trying to be as flexible as possible in the interpretation of the language um, around the bill that gives us the $30 million. So um, we might have a question if you've put something in one bucket um, related to like facilities that we think might better fit in the first bucket about wraparound services and supports for students. So we might have those types of minor questions that come back to you. Additionally, um, we have received clarification from the bill sponsors that they do intend if you've had buses that were destroyed um, or damaged in the, um, in the uh, tornadoes, that you can submit as part of the application process um, a request for reimbursement for those vehicles. So if you if you are in that situation, I know Mayfield is in that situation, but if we have others, if you have any questions about that, you can you can direct those to us. Um, we also had some questions from districts asking specifically for uh, the help that has been received by other districts that are helping them with transportation. Um, about a way to calculate um, the cost that they have incurred toward additional transportation costs. So we did provide in the Monday message of uh, just this past Monday, which is February 21st, sort of a methodology by which you could calculate a cost per mile, um, if that's the path that you'd like to choose. Um, of course, you can also add on to your request for reimbursement any costs that you have incurred related to salaries for bus drivers or monitors or benefits associated with that. So um, we put that out there to trying to help um, as some districts were asking for information on how they could calculate a cost per mile. Um, also wanted to um, point out, and this may just kind of be obvious, but um, if you are receiving insurance proceeds for damage, then we are looking for to reimburse you the net amount that you do not fully recover. So if you have something that, um, you know, you, you get reimbursement from an insurance source and you still have amounts that fall into one of these three buckets that you still are not going to be made whole, then you would send us the amount that it takes to make you whole. So um, I, I hope I've explained that well enough or articulated that well enough. And then finally, um, before we open it up for questions, um, I would like to, if we have time today, hear what you are learning from your PVAs or um, about the lost revenue portion that we have talked about previously on these webcasts. I think at some point we're going to 
hopefully get a, get a, a question that either comes to you or comes to us about how much we are talking about when we're trying to predict or calculate lost revenue. I've had a chance to talk to a few of you, but um, would appreciate if we could spend a little bit of time today just hearing from you what you're hearing from your local PVAs and what um, that lost revenue may look like from now until the end of the school year. Um, or if you're already experiencing that lost revenue because the money's not coming in as you anticipated from January until now, that would be helpful for us to hear as well. So let me pause there, uh, Commissioner, and see if we have any questions at this point in time. This is Lenny Whalen. Hey, Lenny. Hey, how's it going, Robin? Uh, Good. Just, I can tell you from, from a, a doll uh, perspective, uh, we're probably going to be upwards of $15 million in loss uh, property assessments, which is more than likely going to turn into probably in the neighborhood of $150,000, probably somewhere between $125,000 and $150,000 annually. Um, that we're, we have the potential uh, in loss revenue between property taxes and utility taxes and things of that nature. Thank you, Lenny. Appreciate that. So, Robin, this is Joe Henderson from Mayfield. Uh, most of the update numbers I have is about $30 million in uh, assessments, uh, which with our rate equivalents to about a little over $216,000 a year. Um, I'm not quite sure how to put a number on the MBR losses and uh, the utility tax at this point. So uh, that's okay. a very low figure because as we know that uh, obviously there's going to be drops on both of the other sides as well. So that's kind of what I have. So your $216,000 um, that you're estimating annually, tell me again what that represents. That's just real, real estate taxes. Okay, just property tax. Okay, yep. thank you. And Robin, just to jump in there uh, behind Joe, uh, like he mentioned, uh, you know, some of that is kind of projected. We don't know what the total amount's going to be, but that's just our best ballpark. Okay. If I had to throw a number out there, Robin, to maybe encompass everything, I would try to figure on the high end just to be safe when people start asking. So I would say 400000 a year for us. Uh, okay. time the MBR as well as uh, maybe the utility tax in there. I don't know. I may be way off, but obviously it's better to give a higher number and then take less if that's the case. Certainly. High is okay as long as it's still reasonable. So, and that sounds reasonable. And I will say this, and maybe you'll share uh, this with us as well, because I've been in constant contact as well as others about with legislators about things like we're talking about and and I'll just tell you, uh, the the uh, the vibe that I get is there's not a whole lot of support there right now to bridge gaps in tax revenues um, like we're talking about. Uh, maybe maybe more so for the busing and and, mm -hmm. and some of the other things, and maybe even the freezing of the ADA. But I'm not receiving a strong vibe about trying to help with this, and I'm not sure if it's because they feel like that if they do this with school systems, they'd also have to do it with city county governments. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I'm just curious of what you're hearing and, and whether you you're hearing something totally different than I am. Um, I see Brian Perry's on the call with us. He's our legislative liaison. And Brian and I were actually just talking about this earlier today, trying to make sure that we are communicating our best um, estimate on what the dollar amount would look like um, in the aggregate. You know, uh, we want to make sure that that legislators understand per district what the impact would be. Um, so, Brian, I don't know if you have anything else that you can share, but it, it, it was our objective today to hear some of this so that we could pass this information along. Sure. <clears throat> so the first thing I'll mention is that Representative Dawsett filed House Bill 397. That addresses the disaster days 
Uh, so that passed out of the House 97 to nothing last week. It is now over in the Senate. So I suspect that that will get taken care of on the Senate side as well. Uh, but we haven't talked to anybody about that one just yet, but we'll probably go talk as soon as it gets assigned. Well, it got assigned to education, so we'll talk to Max Wise and uh, see what the plan is for hearing that. Um, so that should address that one. Uh, I had a quick conversation with Representative Heath after a committee uh, last week sometime, and it sounds like the some sort of seek freeze will be in the final budget. Uh, I was talking to Robin earlier today, and I think our our thought is that probably won't be in the Senate version that comes out, but will likely get added once they go to free conference. Uh, so uh, just keep that in mind. Um, the local tax revenue, I'm not sure, but these numbers, so I have meetings with uh, Senator Howell tomorrow as well as with Representative Dossett. Uh, so some of these numbers you all were just talking about would be really good to kind of provide them a better picture. I would also, I also told Robin today, I think it'd be really helpful. The more applications you all can turn in between now and when the Senate brings out their budget, the better, because I think that the more data they have going into free conference, the better. Uh, because I'm not sure how they came up with the $30 million for safe, uh, but if the applications that come in are for some number greater than that, I think that it would be great for them to have that going into the conference uh, so that there's at least the option for them to meet that need in the budget, if that makes sense. So. Brian, this is Joe Anderson from Mayfield. Can I ask a follow up question on 397? Yes. So it's obviously one of the things within the bill, if I've read it correctly, is obviously the forgiveness of also uh, contract days for classified and certified employees. Will there be any different implications for uh, employees that are paid through federal programs? I.e. your uh, cafeteria staff members um, and also we have some people that are paid out of federal programs here. So I guess with the legislation override anything from the federal side of it that will allow us to continue to pay those people. I mean, I'll tell my, my, so my first response would be that no, they can't override federal statutes with state statutes. So that's going to be something we need to discuss and figure out how we how we deal with that. Uh, but the simple answer is no, a state statute, they can't enact a state law that overrides a federal law, just broadly. Mm -hmm. So, but we'll, we will talk about that tomorrow and see, uh, get that on the radar and see what we can do. So, so Brian is correct and he said the more applications that we can receive, the better. And I do want to say you don't need to be exact in your, because your application is just that. It is trying to inform us at the Department of Education of what you think those reimbursements might represent and really to help inform us if the 30 million is enough. So if you have to come back later and say, I need to add to my application or I have other expenses that are coming in related to the tornado, then we will certainly work with you to have you amend your application and your budget. Um, but I think it's important that, you know, we use this opportunity as Brian suggested to make sure that we have as much as we can um, information that we can share, especially if we're gonna be over the $30 million. I'm, I'm not feeling that as yet, but, not seeing um, what what might be out there and you all being much more familiar with what your reimbursement requests are going to look like than than I do at this point. I just don't want us to miss an opportunity while they're still in session. Um, so so if you can and if there's anything we can do to help with your applications or if you have questions about that, of course, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. So one more question, Robin. So on the safe lines, <laughs> <clears throat> you mentioned buses, but what about fleet vehicles? Well, the the uh, bill sponsors indicated it was their intent for buses. So the way the language is phrased, it is to provide tran additional transportation costs to provide transportation to students that are displaced from their district or county. So, well, I can get clarification. I'm willing to hear the argument. I mean, I'm willing to hear the argument. That's for sure. Well, the argument that probably uh, shouldn't say is it several times because of 
Uh, uh, busing kids in, we're running Suburbans all over the place on a daily basis trying to get kids. But the problem is we don't have any Suburbans right now, so they're long to us um, and that type thing. So anyway, uh, that would that was the one thing. I, I guess if I had to really reach and try to tie something to that, I could say that. But Yeah, you know, I, I, I think I was, if, if you're transporting kids, even if it's in another vehicle, I think you can get there. Not every day, all day. But yeah, many it days, I don't, there's I don't somewhere think it every day. <laughs> I don't think it has to be every day, all day. Yeah, 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 I would agree. I would say that any expenditure incurring transporting students that were displaced because of the tornado, those expenses would be reimbursable through the safe funds. That'd be yeah. my interpretation. Yeah, as long as you're transporting kids. Joe, did you have any, did you lose any fleet vehicles that were like maintenance vehicles and things like that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Our, so that, that's probably, was, yeah, that's was, probably outside the scope of what it says, uh, but that's a thing that we could raise up with. Uh, Brian may be able to raise up with uh, the senators in his meeting tomorrow to see if we could get something done on the budget yeah. side uh, to maybe pick up some of those other costs you had related to fleet vehicles that were maintenance vehicles or other other things like that. But it sounds like if you're if you got 15 passenger vans or suburbans, you're transporting students in those, they would qualify. Yeah, I think so. And, okay. and the other thing, just as a reminder, remember there is that other pot of money that is still for Western Kentucky tornado mm -hmm. relief. It's just not under the purview of KDE. So um, even I think you could still apply under that path to be reimbursed. The language in there is very broad. It doesn't break it down in the same way as the 30 million is broken down. So I think our first path is asking the um, legislators if there's any other way to do it. And our fallback position would be to go for the money at military affairs. Okay, well, we've covered um, safe fund and where we are now and some information on that. Brian's been able to uh, come on and talk a little bit about where things are with the legislative process. Um, any other items or things that we need to raise in our time together? Yes, I hate to do all the talking, but I have one more. House, yeah, Bill, go ahead. House Bill 397 addresses, um, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page because I've been told by one thing by legislators, but I wanted to make sure on this call that I bring this up. So House Bill 397 talks about forgiveness of days. Now, I'm under the assumption that it had bipartisan support, so it'll pass through the Senate. So, but it doesn't specifically mention minutes. So if we start converting to 1,062 hours, uh, I just want to make sure that we're all under the understanding that that is allowable under House Bill 397 to be able to use, go 1,062 hours. I understand there is no, uh, you still are binded by contractual days and that type thing for employees. But is that your understanding or interpretation of the bill to be able to allow us to complete the 1,062 hours and not have to meet the minimum of 170 days? I'm bringing up the bill now to take a look at it, um, and I hesitate to offer an opinion on the fly on it without looking at it more closely, Joe. Um, Joe, that's that that's not what I understand. Basically, I think if you're uh, essentially in a position to um, have up to 15 instructional days, that would be the equivalent of taking if you end up using a full 15 days, which we wouldn't be doing. But essentially, you deduct whatever those 15 days worth of hours are, uh, subtract that from the 1,062. Okay, we only missed 10 days, so I wouldn't need 15 days of forgiveness. But my point is, if we were looking at it on an hourly basis, like what is it, Senate Bill 1 due to the COVID bill that allowed us to meet the hourly requirement, but not necessarily have to achieve the 170 days. So my point is, if I count those 10, 10 days, disaster days, I assume it's allowable that I take the number of minutes that I would have been in class on those, or instructional, or would have been uh, instruction occurring on those days, I could just use those minutes toward the multiplier to get to 1,062. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah, you wanted, you wanted to convert over. I understand the problem. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, have our legal team evaluate the bill and see if it's written in a way that allows for that uh, conversion. Uh, and it, I'm supportive of the concept that you're talking about. And so if we feel 
Uh, if Todd Allen and his team feel like uh, it, it gets us there, then I think we're good to go. If we feel like there's a problem with the way it's constructed, we it's still not passed yet. It's in the Senate. And so there may be an amendment uh, in Senate education in the floor or when it comes to the uh, uh, the uh, concurrent committee uh, for changes to it there. So l let me work on it from that standpoint. But I'm, I'm supportive of the concept of what you're trying to do. So, and the reason I want to, and I'm asking because, I, you know, I was one that added 25 minutes to my day uh, after the tornado because I did not know that there was going to be any measure of forgiveness. And I, obviously our people, you know, mm -hmm. they don't want to be in the school of June to June like, you know, the others. So now we're sitting there with all of that extra time that we've accumulated since we've started back. And, you know, I just, I mean, that's, that's why I'm asking that, you know, I want to see how all this converts into the minutes game. Sure, sure. I understand completely. Uh, I'm, again, supportive of the concept of what you're talking about. I just want to make sure that as we read through what's in this statute that I don't tell you today something that would be illegal later. So it's be it's better to raise it now and see if we can get it clarified uh, before it becomes statute. Thank you. Where are we on assessments? Not in a good place. <laughs> Uh, we have reached out to the U.S. Department of Education and asked for an informal opinion on is there any flexibility to be provided around assessments. Uh, the response back we got was no. Uh, they held up several other places around the country where there had been natural disasters, most recently um, Puerto Rico, uh, and that withstood hurricanes that, that um, devastated the, that whole island. Uh, and they said they did not provide any um flexibility or waive any students out of taking assessments. So um, we can uh, more formally ask. Uh, I don't expect us to get a better answer. I think you should prepare to give assessments to your kids this year. Even for accountability. There's no waiver of accountability either. I'm not expecting any waivers of any kind uh, oh. for accountability or taking the test. Uh, so that's that's the message that we got back and that was an informal discussion so we don't have anything on paper from them but uh, we didn't hear back that they were amenable to that request hmm. interesting so we'll uh, pro proceed this way um todd i I think Todd Allen's on. I saw him, his name pop up in the chat uh, just a moment ago. Todd, if you could review House Bill 397 um, for me and give me an uh, opinion on the language around, I think it's in Section 1, it talks about the 15 student days, and um, and are we on solid ground to interpret that to be able to convert back and forth into minutes and days the way that uh, Superintendent Henderson described? Uh, then I think we can we can resolve that issue and and I'll follow up with an email to uh, the folks that are um, in this group on on that issue so you've got we've got clarity on it uh, and Joe related to the issue that you raise uh, I'll touch base also with uh, Rhonda Sims uh, to validate what I talked about with you today around assessment and accountability um, but for right now I think it's you should start preparing to assess. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, well, I, I think it, at this time we can bring the uh, huddle to a close. And I, the question that I always want to end with on this is, do we want to do this again in a couple of weeks? Um, so uh, it seems like we still got some moving parts we want to continue to process through. Should we go ahead and schedule one one of these in two weeks? All right, seeing some head nods, we'll get that uh, structured and, and scheduled sent out to you. Uh, thanks everybody, appreciate uh, the feedback and we'll keep, keep working with you. And um, uh, thanks for being on with us this afternoon.